how can people think about the best way they can learn? What are different styles? What are different methods that you think people can think? If someone's listening right now and they're like, Andrew, well, I want to learn a new instrument or I want to learn a new language. Or maybe it's, I want to learn how to start a podcast or I want to learn how to play a sport or whatever it may be. How can someone start thinking about how they should approach learning? Terrific question. And fortunately, nowadays, we can look to studies done in humans that define some very key principles. The first principle is that the whole process of neuroplasticity and learning is really a two-stage process. First, there must be focus and alertness. That focus and alertness is associated with the release of neurochemicals, so-called neuromodulators, things like acetylcholine in particular, which sort of acts as a highlighter pen, if you will, for certain connections in the brain to later be reinforced. And the neurochemical adrenaline, which is also called epinephrine, also depending on if you're in the UK or elsewhere. <laughs> a long, interesting story, not for this time, about why it has multiple names. Epinephrine, also called adrenaline, is associated with an increase in kind of agitation and alertness. Acetylcholine, think of it as kind of a spotlight or a highlighter pen for certain connections in the brain. So you need alertness and focus. And then the second stage is that it is only during periods of deep rest, in particular sleep and something that I call non-sleep deep rest, which I've given an acronym because scientists like acronyms, NSDR, non-sleep deep rest, things like yoga nidra, things like shallow naps, things like forms of meditation that don't involve a lot of uh, focused concentration. You're uh, far more the experienced uh, meditator than I, so I'm outside my wheelhouse when talking about meditation. But it is only periods of intense focus and alertness followed by periods of deep rest that allow the nervous system to change. And there is an abundance of evidence for that. So that's the first thing to understand. The brain actually rewires during deep sleep and rest because during deep sleep and rest, naps, yoga nidra, deep sleep, there's a replay of the very same cells in the brain that were active during learning, oftentimes in reverse for reasons that are still not understood, but at a much higher repetition rate. So you're actually getting repetitions while you sleep. This is why one will strain to learn a language or a motor skill or maths or something like that over and over and over. It doesn't happen. You take a couple of nights sleep, take a break from it, all of a sudden it's there. It's because it happens in rest. Now there's some other things that one can do to enhance this process further that are arrived to us from good data. First of all, there's a so-called ultradian rhythm, which is the 90 minute cycles during which we can focus pretty well for a duration of about 90 minutes. Of course, flickering in and out of focus. Nobody really focuses for 90 minutes straight unless they've built up that capacity or they are very interested in what they're learning, <laughs> right? They're just wrapped with attention. Usually people flicker in and out. And of course, nowadays, there's a lot of literature and ideas about ways to maintain focus. Put the phone away, uh, limit noise. Some people like background noise. Some people like music. Some don't. It's very contextual, highly individualized. But 90 minutes is sort of the, the, the batch of time that the brain can focus really hard on one thing before it needs a true rest of, of an hour or two before you can go back to learning or working very hard. The other thing is that um, there's some very interesting data showing that Shallow naps or NSDR, non-sleep deep rest, done within four hours of one of these 90-minute learning bouts can be very beneficial for accelerating learning. And then there are these uh, incredible data on so-called gap effects. So there have been studies now of, of skills that are physical skills, mental skills, where people will, for instance, try to learn scales on the piano or a math problem or a spatial problem or a physical skill. And then at random, every so often, a buzzer will go off and the person will just be told to do nothing sit there eyes closed or eyes open and do nothing, just stop the learning process for about 10 seconds and then return to doing what they're doing. These are these little micro rests. It turns out that during those micro rests, the hippocampus, a brain area, as you know, that's associated with learning and memory and the neocortex also associated with learning and memory, undergoes replay of the thing that the individual is trying to learn at 20 times the speed, also in reverse, just as in sleep. And that has can lead and has been shown to lead to accelerations in learning. So there are these ways, I wouldn't even think of them as hacks because the word hack is a little tricky because it, when I think of the word hack, it seems like doing something with an object or a tool that wasn't designed for that purpose, yeah. right? Um, the nervous system already harbors these mechanisms and one can access them through these little micro rests. So whether or not you're a child or an adult, every so often when trying to learn something, just pause for 10 seconds or so, do your best to just clear your mind, of course, it's very hard to clear the mind, but um, 
do your best to clear the mind and then go back to the learning task as as it were and that has been shown to very to significantly accelerate the learning process and the retention of newly learned information and then the last thing you touched on earlier which is this notion of incremental learning you said you like to throw yourself into something as kind of a litmus test of whether or not you enjoy it or not turns out that uh, from beautiful work done by my colleague at Stanford School of Medicine Eric Knudsen has shown that yes it's true that early in development in humans, this would be up until the mid 20s. We can learn things in larger batches and much more easily than we can later in life. However, if one batches that work into smaller increments, and for, so for instance, deciding maybe set a timer, turning the phone off otherwise, and saying, I'm going to spend three minutes, just three minutes, in trying to intensely learn this thing, even if I feel like I'm failing, if one does that repeatedly, those little increments of learning can lead to an outsized amount of learning overall. And so the nervous system loves incremental learning. It loves to batch things into focused little bouts. And you know, if that's already the, the tools that you've built up, which it sounds like you have, wonderful. But if somebody is out there trying, you know, struggling to learn, really trying to break things down into very brief periods of intense focus, that is the cue by which during sleep, the nervous system will change itself. And this has been shown over and over and over again, even in very late life uh, individuals, people in their, you know, we like to think life could go on further than this, but people in their 80s and 90s still have neuroplasticity. There's even evidence that new neurons can be produced in the hippocampus of people in their late 80s and 90s. So the capacity is there. This is why I love what you do, because you would never consider that the answer to learning is deep rest, right. more sleep. Provided the focus comes first. Of course, right. yeah, of course, the focus right. and the attention, as you but said. But of course, sleep deprivation makes it very hard yeah. to learn. And there's a, something else that, important that happens in sleep. Nowadays, we, I think most people, thanks to the beautiful work of Matthew Walker at Berkeley and others, really understand the value of sleep for health, immune system function, et cetera. There is a stage of sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, that we're all familiar with, of course, with, and li where literally the eyes are moving, um, that tends to come later in the night, during the second half of sleep, where there's a, there's a tendency to have very emotional dreams, or at least dreams that are uh, laden with a lot of emotional content of some kind. During rapid eye movement sleep, there's an inability to move the body. We call this atonia. It's a, literally a, a sleep-induced paralysis that's healthy. And a complete failure of the nervous system to release adrenaline, epinephrine. This is sort of like a trauma therapy in some sense. If you think about it, it's a replay of an emotional event minus the neurochemical that makes us feel tense and agitated. So in our mind, those dreams can often feel very distressing. It's been shown that if you deprive people of, of rapid eye movement sleep, they fail to, to dump the negative emotions of things that happened the day before and the day before. And I think all of us have experienced the shift in emotionality that happens when we are sleep deprived. What ends up happening is that the little things seem like big things, but after a few nights sleep, we're okay. And there's no mystery to why that is anymore. I think we, almost every sleep scientist believes it has something to do with this built-in kind of trauma release therapy where you get to experience the thing in your sleep minus the neurochemicals that make your body feel terrible. And somehow that dissociation allows people to then step back into life with a, with a clean slate. Wow. Yeah. No, I've, I've heard those ideas before, but the way you just wove it all together is, is really special.